So, I don't need to pray. I thought of praying, but then uh, I think Johanna prayed for me. So that was great. Thank you for praying. Oh no, it was Jane. Was it Jane? Jane. 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 Yes. D? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Um, okay, so uh, can I have the next slide? Do you guys have the button thingies? No? Okay, that's okay. So I want to start off this um, talk, right, with you guys. Um, very simply by putting the title of today's session back to you. Are you okay? Right? And so all of us here, like I said, you can be comfortable, right? You are safe, you can really just ask yourself that question, right? Are you okay? And some of you may be thinking, oh, that's so cringe, right? That's so weird. Um, but it's, it's a really important thing, right? For two main reasons. Number one, next slide, please. You have to ask, are you okay for yourself, for your own sake, right? Because as you may know, you are a person, right? Everyone here should know that you're a person. So you have responsibilities, you have uh, obligations, you have unique talents and you, your strengths and weaknesses. You are a person that's unique. So if I ask you, are you okay, right? There is a responsibility that you hold to yourself. Right? And so how, how would you know if you're okay, right? So just some random questions for you to ask yourself, right? How do you handle stress? So for just now when you guys are having the, I think it was like Kahoot, well it's not really Kahoot, right? It's like some game quiz thing that you guys are doing. And then the room went down, everyone was panicking, well not really, but you guys were all pretty chill, right? But if your exams were coming up or your assignments and you had to submit it, turn it in, do you guys still use turn it in? Yeah. yeah, okay, so you guys have to turn it in, and you know, the plagiarism bar is supposed to be in the green, but actually it's red, and then you're like, I, I referenced everything, and everything is in order, and everything, and then after that, it's still in red, right? How do you handle that stress? Or when your edgy room is down, which back in my day, nobody used edgy room. Everybody used edgy room one, because that's where the cool kids were, right? Uh, everyone else used visitor or whatever, but edgy room will, well, was, and I assume is, and also assume always will be, bad, right? <laughs> so every time there's poor Wi-Fi, you'll see three lines, but it's still not going through, right? So how, how do you deal with stress? That's one question you can ask yourself, right? Um, another thing, right? How do you handle your free time? When you're alone by yourself, are you someone who can handle it? Well, when it's silent, you don't have any music playing, no Spotify, no Netflix, nothing. How do you handle your thoughts? Right? And, and just ask yourself that, right? No judgment, but just asking yourself, are you okay? And that can give you a small glimpse, right, as to the answer to that question. All right, so, that, so that's the first one, right? For your own sake, are you okay? And the second question, uh, next one, thank you, is for the sake of others. Right, so you guys have heard it before, right? You have to take care of yourself first before you take care of others, right? Uh, when you're on the airplane, they always say, if you have children, well, I hope you guys don't have children. But if you have children, right, you wear the mask first for yourself. If there's an emergency, you wear it first. Then only you take care of your baby, right? Or not baby, whatever, right? So, so that's the whole point. Now, the next part is for the sake of others. Now, how do you know that you're okay for the sake of others? So I'll give you two scenarios. Number one, a friend of yours comes over and, you know, you guys are having lunch and he says, hey, I need to tell you something. I haven't eaten a proper meal for the past week. And he lifts up his sleeve and he shows you that he's been cutting himself. How do you respond? Now that's something that a lot of you guys are, okay, you know, this is serious, but this is real life. How do I know? A friend of mine came to me like that. So I was uh, not here, I was in another place. Um, and a friend of mine came up to me and we were having dinner and she said, hey, uh, remember when you said I could talk to you about anything? And I said, yeah. So I thought she was gonna talk about boy troubles. Like, oh, this is Sebastian. You know, that kind of thing. But, or, I'm sorry if your name is Sebastian. Yeah, I know. But, um, so I thought it was just boy trouble, right? Because I'm 
the love guru. I'm joking. No, but, but so I thought it was just boy trouble, but then she showed me her arm and I saw that she had been cutting herself. And so the question then is, are you okay? How would you respond, right? Are you aware and are you, are you able, right, to deal with that? So that's the first one. Second one is, let's say a cousin of yours, right? Um, after a family reunion, you guys are having fun and all that, and she pulls you aside and says, hey, I need to talk to you. Um, I just came back from the doctor and I was diagnosed with cancer. And I don't know if I should be, you know, uh, going for chemotherapy because the doctor said that I only have a 20% chance of living, right? After chemotherapy, radiation therapy, everything, I only have a 20% chance that I'll make it to my 30s. So I'm contemplating about taking my own life. So how do you respond? Right? And so these are scary and I mean, obviously it's a lot more serious now, but this is real life, right? And so can I have the next slide, please? This is the new normal. So society before, right, has always been giving you this narrative that you and the person next to you are all going to be fine. Right? Just buy this product, do this thing, become this person, and you'll be fine. Right? As long as you do A, B, C, you're fine. But from the recent three years, maybe, in our nation alone, our suicide rates have, you know, rose. Like, they've, they've gone really high. Same with mental health issues, right? Now, the Malaysian... I wouldn't say healthcare, uh, but the, the, the hospitals and all that now have a lot more cases that you're reporting for mental health issues, right? Mental health struggles. Compared to before the pandemic, that was very rare. Insurance, uh, you know, programs, you know, Prudential, all of that, most of them didn't really cover mental health problems, right? Depression, anxiety, all that kind of stuff, right? But now, some are starting to spread out. And so these are, these are your um, environments, right? This, this is the environment that we're growing into, right? Most of you guys, how many of you guys are final year students? Yeah, so a lot of you guys are going into that world, right? So here, I mean, you guys are all safe. You guys are, you know, holding hands, singing Kumbaya, my Lord. You guys are fine. But even here, right, there will be some people who are struggling, right? People who are maybe feeling a bit low on, you know, uh, most days they're a little bit on the emo side, right? And so on and so forth. Now, maybe they have depression, right? But the question I want you guys to ask is, are you okay? In the sense that, are you okay if someone came up to you and asked you, hey, I need someone to help me out? And then the other one is, you have to ask yourself, are you okay in terms of your own well-being. So, so those are some things that I want to help you guys. So I know this is going to be a really uh, tense or, or very, you know, intense uh, session. But again, I want to say, as long as you're feeling comfortable, safe, right, and that you can be yourself, right? Don't have to pretend, don't have to do anything. I, I, I have to disclaim that I'm not a doctor. I wish I was, uh, but I'm not a doctor. Right? I'm not going to give you medication or anything like that, but um, for almost 10 years now, right, I've been journeying with people, uh, whether they were students like me or you know, they're my juniors, right? like many of you guys are. Right? Uh, I've journeyed with them. Right? And so I've learned some things that I hope can help you and help you help others. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, Rena, am I okay? Okay, cool. Yeah, he's the only person that I know has the, the, the name. Everyone else is just a blurry face for now. Uh, but it, in a nice way, a, a very beautiful blurry face. Um, yeah. 
So this is the new normal, right? So next slide, please. And like I was saying, because it's the new normal, it's not unheard of anymore, right? So we can't be indifferent or ignorant anymore, right? So when I ask you the question, are you okay to take care of others? You can't think, ah, I'll figure it out later, right? Because it's the same thing, right? We always hear this, prevention, it, prevention is better than cure. Yeah, I would agree with that, right? Because if you have a chance to learn about it now, it will help. Because the worst thing is, if later on, you have to go through all of this, and after that, you don't have that much time, right? Because your friend is calling you, and she's on the window ledge, or he's you know, just had a really bad fight back at home, and he needs someone now. So how are you gonna find out then? You get what I mean? So it's always good to prepare, right? Even if you're not struggling with it, right? Preparing is always good. So that's one thing. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. What's your name, by the way? Dorcas? Okay, nice to meet you. Okay, thank you, Dorcas. Um, so this is me. If you guys can see, there's a little bit of resemblance. <laughs> a little bit. My hair kind of grew, but not that much. But this is me. So I was about eight or nine years old, roughly eight plus. And uh, this is a, a role play, I guess, if that's what you call it, right? Let's pretend. Um, so imagine this small, chubby, well, not really chubby, but this very smiley, bald, eight-year-old kid came up to you and said, hey, Poco uh, Cheche, right? Uh, uh, older brother, older sister. And he tugs on your shirt and he says, I, I need to tell you a secret. At the age of eight, I have stood on a window ledge twice and wanted to kill myself. How would you respond? That was my starting point, I guess, with mental health. I didn't know it at the time, right? I didn't have it all figured out, like, okay, now I have to go see a psychiatrist and all that. Like, I didn't really figure it out, but that was my starting point. I didn't know it at the time. You see, growing up, I came from a very big family, right? And we didn't have that much money. So what we had to do was we had to work at a very young age. So I started working about this age, right? Seven years old, I was working in a cafe. I was working, you know, in whatever jobs that I could get, right? So I could get some money so that me and my siblings could have some food. And that's one of the, the realities, right, that we have to step into, right? So it's not always just, you know, the girl who is sad and, you know, has everything in life, but her hormones are just not functioning well, right? It could also be because of life stress. Because imagine you are eight years old and all of your friends or people your age are playing with toys, but at the age of eight, you know how to use a cash register, and you know how to cook food, and you know how to make drinks, and you know how to deal with customers that are 50, 60 years old, right? And so that's one thing I wanna share with you, right? It can happen to anyone, and it doesn't always happen because of X, Y, Z. It can be anything, right? So next slide, please. That's me, I had hair. Um, and I was working. So that's me um, in the kitchen washing dishes, right? So this page, uh, this picture, I was about eight, uh, sorry, eight, uh, 14 years old, about there, right? And then the next slide. That was me when I was studying here. Um, wow, that's like four or five years ago, right? And so the story was, even though I had a rough childhood, having to work throughout my teens, when I came to uni, I thought, oh, now I get to be with, you know, other students and I can just be a normal guy. No, right? So what happened when I was in uni is I had appendicitis, which is where they remove your appendix, which I tend to use as an excuse for my weight gain. But that's, that's a story, right? So I had appendicitis and it kind of got complicated um, lots of different complications. I had uh, not just me, but 
um, three of my siblings who had medical emergencies as well at the same time, right? So I had my appendix and then uh, my sister had another uh, chronic illness. Another brother uh, injured his back. A sister injured his back, her back. And my mom also got a full range of like illnesses as well. So all of that came at me at once and I was like, oh man, how am I gonna deal with this, right? And so that's where it just started flooding, right? So that was my story, right? But like I said back then in the first picture, right? That was my first time being exposed to this, but it wasn't my only time, right? So next slide, please. This is where I tell you about my third person experience. So when I was, a, I, I didn't write anything on the, on the slide, by the way, because I want to protect people's identity and stuff. Um, but when I was in college, I met up with so many people. So I was in this college, right, that I'll leave unnamed, and everywhere I went, I had all these people who had smiles, right? People like me and you, we, we look normal. But when I sat down with them one-on-one, -on -one, they would tell me some of the craziest things that happened in their lives, right? People who have had eating disorders, people who have uh, self-harm, people who have um, dealt with all kinds of hidden battles, right? That's what we call it, hidden battles or invisible battles, right? Where you and I can look at them and they're like, oh, they're fine, right? They're just like us. But in some sense, they're not. Because many of them were just having so many struggles, right, that we couldn't see, right? And I think this is something that we have to be aware of, right? Like I always say, aware of, right? We cannot just assume like, oh, they're fine, right? All of the people around us have some struggles, right? Like I said, uh, you know, all that. But you guys may have your own story. I don't know your story. I wish I did. Right, but I don't. And so because of that, I have learned not to assume that you guys have a privileged background, right? Now, if you guys do, that's great, but many people don't, right? So this is where we have to, in a sense, be humble, right? Because humility is where you're putting yourself in a place where you're not thinking about yourself or what you think is right or what your assumptions are you know, accurate or whatever. It's about the other person, right? And so when you approach someone and you're trying to make friends and all that, like this is where you, you guys get that training ground, right? As you're, for, for many of you, like even for myself as well, the friends that I've had up till now are from uni, right? And so I, I hope that you guys are here and you guys feel at home and you guys, uh, cultivate right that that community that friendship right some of you guys are you know dating and all that that's fine right uh, but likewise as well you want to cultivate those um, relationships and friendships because those are what you'll carry forward into your future right when you graduate you're gonna go to work and trust me nobody likes working right and everyone's just in a bad mood no one wants to be happy right so you're gonna need friends to journey with you through that. Right. Are you guys okay so far? None of you guys are crying, right? You guys are crying? So if you guys are crying, please know it's okay to cry. Um, I cry too. Um, but the next part of this is, I want to tell you guys, um, is I, I want to be very honest here. Right? I, I try not to sugarcoat um, whenever I do talk to you guys because, I mean, I, I don't know your story, like I said. Right? So I don't know where you guys are going to go. I don't know who you're going to talk to. Um, but I have to share my heart and the experiences that I've gone through. And so it's, it's really tough for me because I, I, like I, I think um, Johanna was saying, like I've been in ministry for a while. Um, but what I've noticed in my life and in the lives of those I've walked with is the church tends to get it wrong, right? And 
I'm not saying that Christianity is false or whatever. I'm saying it's true, right? God is good. God is real, right? Jesus does love you, but the reality is it's hard, right? Life is hard. And you just have to look at the news, right? Just now we were doing the prayer, right? Syria, Ohio, right? The explosion, right? All of these things. And for some of you guys, even exams are crazy, right? Assignments, FYP. Man, I hated my FYP, <laughs> right? So life is hard, right? And so when I went to the church, um, a lot of times I felt alone, right? So I would go up to so-and-so and I'll be like, hey, um, Mr. A, uh, let's just use Sebastian, okay? So uh, Sebastian, so I go, hey, Mr. Sebastian, um, I'm kind of going through something and I need your help, right? I, I need someone to talk to. And you guys already kind of know where this is going, right? They're gonna say, oh, don't worry, I'll pray for you. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, is that all, right? Is, is, is all you're gonna do is just pray for me when I'm not here? How do I know you're even praying for me, right? Because I'm, I'm constantly dealing with so much anxiety, so much stress, right, about my family's health and everything. And the best you can do is I'll pray for you, right? And then I come up to another person and, uh, you know, they, they gave me this, um, cliche, right? Oh, uh, just have more faith, right? And I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't really help, <laughs> right? Because then you're saying, oh, okay, I don't have faith, so that means I have to make more faith on top of having to deal with medical issues, you know, financial stress, everything else. So, okay, I have to add one more thing to do on the list, right? Which is actually very encouraging when you look at scripture. Because scripture never says that you have to create faith, right? The whole idea of grace and faith is that it's a gift of God, right? Um, I don't know if you guys know. Do you guys know John Piper? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, a couple of you guys waiting. Yeah, great. So John Piper also says that saving faith is a gift of God, right? You can't create faith. And so likewise, the same thing, right? I was in this space that I couldn't even do anything physically, emotionally, mentally, and then now you're telling me to do something spiritually. And that was just so overwhelming. But then I realized when I look at scripture and I, stu I studied, uh, you know, uh, theology and all that on my own, uh, I, I started doing that and I realized that's not biblical either. I, uh, it's not mine to create, right? You can have faith, right? But that faith has to you know, be, it's okay, amen. Uh, you know, you're gonna have people who, uh, it's fine, we're all okay. Uh, the, the faith that we have has to have substance, right? Something or someone, right? I have faith in Rain, right? I'm assuming that he exists and I assume something about his character, right? And I know he's, he's the best, right? He's the goat, is that what they call him? <laughs> Right? So, so that's what I'm saying, right? And, and so these were all of my experiences with church. And so went to one church, two church, three church, four. It was just the same across the board. And so I, I hope that you guys are, as you guys are hearing this, you guys don't go into lawyer mode, right? Don't, don't go into defense like, oh, you know, maybe you just didn't go to my church. You know, maybe you didn't go to my church branch. Maybe you didn't go to my cell group. I went across many churches, right? I have been to, uh, well, okay, so I grew up in a brethren church, right? Any brethren here? One, two, hey, represent one. Hey. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I grew up in a brethren church. And then after that, I went to a charismatic church. Anyone in charismatic church? One, two, hey, also represent. Right? And then after that, I went to a Methodist church. Anyone Methodist here? <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, I can't see anyway. Uh, so don't worry, I won't call you out. But uh, then after that, I went to an Anglican church. Anglican church. Oh, okay, very happy at the back there. Okay, right? So I, I've been to all denominations. I've been to churches across the board. And it breaks my heart to say 
that the experience was the same. Everywhere I went, everyone had all kinds of promises, right? People would say, oh, don't worry, man. I'm going to send you a prayer every night. Every night? Every night. Okay. One day, they did it. Good job. Two days, three days, and then it started getting quiet. One week passed. Two weeks pass. And after that, you see them in church. Hey, bro. Hey, how are you? Uh? Uh, still the same. Still stressed out. Still depressed. Still. Uh, I don't know if you guys read, but I was diagnosed with OCD. So this is the worst thing to have in a pandemic. Uh, so I, I still had OCD. And he was like, oh, okay, okay. Don't worry. I'll pray for you. Right? No, nothing, right? So the whole everyday thing only lasted for like four days. Same thing with another friend of mine, right? And, and I know she means well, but same thing, right? They have this idea that, oh, okay, I just need to pray. I just need to do this, that, and then, you know, gauten, right? Everything finished. But that's not how it works, right? Um, a lot of you may, well, I hope you guys know uh, John Piper. Right? Also struggled with seasons of depression. Um, oh, wow. Okay. That's fine. Um, so some uh, of you may know that, right? He struggled with depression. Some of you guys may also know Charles Spurgeon also struggled with depression. Right? Um, there's a growing consensus, right? a growing agreement that Martin Luther... Right, the guy who, you know, uh, basically started in a way the Reformation. Right, us Protestant Christians came from Martin Luther. Right, he was the one who did the Fifty Theses, not not kind of thing, and he was said to have a form of OCD. Right, something called scrupulosity. Right, religious OCD, and so all of these things are coming and we have to realize it doesn't just stay here and then go off after a week, right? Because, and so this is one thing also I wanna encourage you, right? If you guys are, you know, for the second part, right? Helping others, if you are willing to serve the person that is, you know, your friend or your family, if they are struggling and you wanna serve them, don't make empty promises because a, a image, right? A picture, a word picture is that promise you've made is a lifeline. You guys know what a lifeline is, right? When you're swimming, when you're drowning, you throw that little donut thing, that floaty donut, and then you grab it and you pull. So if you're making an empty promise, you throw that lifeline and you just leave it. You're supposed to pull, right? You're supposed to put in effort, energy, time, right? Whatever you got, you're going to give it so that I can get to safe, you know, shore. And so when you throw me the donut and leave me there, I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> right? Because all you're doing is you gave me something to hold. And so I'm like, okay, I'm safe. Thank God. And then I wait and I wait and I wait and my hands are getting tired and I'm just constantly being rocked back and forth by the waves of depression, of anxiety, and nobody's coming to get me. So I'm just rocking back and forth. And that's what you're doing when you give empty promises. So please don't do that, right? Instead, take a moment, go on Google. How many of you guys have Google? Don't raise your hand. Everybody here has Google, right? Use it. Just research, right? If someone has bulimia, go to Google, right? Learn about it. You don't have to do it at the immediately, right? You can be there and emotionally hear them out and then go back home and look at it later, right? Learn, right? Trust me, okay? Trust me. Um, okay, maybe I shouldn't say this. Well, I'm going to say it anyway. But, okay, I have a belief that what you learn in your classrooms 
will not remotely be as important as you learning how to care for others. Okay? So you can start, and, and don't say, oh, okay, he said that I don't have to study, then, no, no. okay, study, okay, I sound like my sister, she's like that too. Uh, but, you know, don't study, right, study, but whenever you have the chance, learn so that you can help yourself and help others. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so now I'm going to the next one, which is what I've learned. And so, next slide. <laughs> this is what I said just now, right? Jesus is real, and life is hard. And here's where I guess I wanna speak to those of you who are suffering, right? So don't raise your hand, but I see you, right? I, I know that you're here. And I want you to feel safe, right? I want you to feel uh, loved. We're gonna do a Q&A later, right? So please, it, it's anonymous. So you guys are you guys are fine, right? Do we still have time for Q and A? We do, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we're gonna have a Q and A, right? So this is where I want to talk to you, and you guys get to talk to me through Q and A and stuff like that. But um, this is where I want to talk to you, right? As a person who has gone through it. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dorcas. Um, use anything, right? Anything at all, if you can think of it, and you think it might help. Use it, provided it's healthy, right? And it's good, and it doesn't harm you or anyone else. But use anything, right? So I listed out a few things, right? Um, scripture, go for it, right? If you don't have a Bible, get someone. CF has a lot of Bibles, right? I, uh, I assume you guys still have it. If you guys don't, why? Because I, before I graduated, I dropped like 200 ringgit just to buy books. So the person, who's the CEO now? You? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. So back then, uh, it was this box, right? Of like a few books and a few CDs and all. You guys don't use CDs, you can throw that out. But anyway, so you guys had like this box. And it was called the CF Books Box or whatever, right? And then I was like, you know what? It's not good enough. So I was like, revamp. So I called it the CF Knowledge Corner. Oh. <laughs> Right? So I called it the CF Corner and I stacked it with books. I put Bibles in there. I don't know if you're still, you're still, still Bibles. Yeah. So if you don't have a Bible, get the Bible. Right? And, and learn scripture. And so this is where you get to experience what it actually is to hear from God through scripture. Because the Bible, right, is, yes, a very big book. Lots of things to read, understand. But if you can find little gems in scripture, that can get you through a day, that's a win, right? For me, that, that, that scripture was 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. How many of you guys know that verse? It's okay, no, no, I raised my hand. Uh, so 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, right, is every promise, right, of God, find their yes, or in some translations say, find their amen in Christ Jesus. Because during my struggles of OCD and being diagnosed with anxiety, uh, health anxiety and all that, and just so much stress and anger and resentment and feelings of abandonment from the church, I felt abandoned from God. I was just like, okay, you made so many promises in the Bible. Where is it? Right? This is me talking to God, right? All of these promises, you know, you guys hear it all the time, right? God is with you, you know, don't be afraid, all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm afraid and I don't see you, right? That's what I felt. Every time I drove from, uh, back then I used to drive, uh, I would drive, I would cry in the car because I didn't know where God was. And if I was so stressed out and I didn't have, thank you, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I didn't feel that, right, that closeness with God. And so that was something that I was going through, right? So learn scripture. Medication, also a great thing, right? These are uh, other things that I'm listing out, but uh, in, in theology, we call it common grace, right? These are things that you can use, right, for your 
uh, life, right? For your uh, improvement and all that. Okay, so next slide, please. So when is my turn? So this is a very short one. I'm gonna tell you guys um, about what time does Q and A start again, Joanna? Sorry, eight. Okay, I got four minutes. That's gonna go. All right. So uh, when it was my experience. I'm going to share it with you. So many of you guys have heard of OCD, right? How many of you guys have heard OCD? Okay, yeah. But mm, I, I hope none of you have experienced it. It's what they call the doubting disease. So what is OCD? OCD and this whole idea of doubt is you're not too sure. So you're sure that you lock the door, but how sure are you about that sureness? right? Or you drove your car, right? You're sure that you parked it, you know, in a good place. But what if you didn't? And so you start doubting. Yeah, you think that, you know, you washed your hands after the pandemic, but how sure are you that you're clean? So for my OCD was with contamination, right? So like I said, worst thing to have in a pandemic. I had all of this anxiety with germs, and honestly, it, it, you guys are the first people that I'm talking to in person. Everything else I've done is all online, right? But uh, it took a lot for me to be here, right? Um, I personally work with a, well, some people call it performance coach. I call them therapists. Um, and I had to work with my therapist, right? My performance coach for two months just so I could be here, just so I can hold this mic. Just so, you know, when people came up to me, I was like, hey, this bump, right? Because back then, I would freak out, right? I would not be able to hug or fist bump or even, you know, be anywhere close to you guys. That would have freaked me out. So here's the experiment that I'm going to share with you, right? Um, my fear is with germs. But when I do the fist bump and all that, it's not because I think you're dirty. It's because I think I'm dirty. So because of my health issues and all that, my fear is you guys will get sick and go through the same horrible medical uh, procedures that I had to go through. And I don't want you to do that. So because of that, I make sure I don't touch you guys. Right? And so when I fist bump you, in my head, at the beginning, when I fist bump you, it's a death certificate that I'm giving you. So fist bump, fist bump, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, right? And so you guys might be thinking, ah, no no such thing, right? <laughs> but that's the whole idea of doubt. Yeah, it, it's true, right? I don't think a fist bump will kill you, but what if? What if I was carrying a very contagious, very deadly disease that I didn't know of and nobody else knows about, and I passed it to you? And after that, you rub your nose or you got, you know, some meat stuck in your teeth and you are, right? And then you get sick and you die. That's on me, right? And for me, I care about people. Like if you were to tell me, okay, I got a gun to your head, I'm gonna kill you, you know, to save a homeless man, for example, right? Some of you may think, oh, I'm not homeless. I think I would wanna live, I would be fine with dying. Right? For me, I want to serve other people. I don't want to deal with you know, uh, having to protect myself and all that kind of stuff. For me, it's always about other people. So that's what OCD attacked for me. So when I clean, I clean for the sake of you, not for the sake of me. If I'm just left by myself, I'm on an island by myself, it's fine, right? I can just not clean. But because I live with so many siblings and so many friends and people that I love and I care about, I clean, and I clean, and I clean. So the last part that I wanna share with you is how my cleaning goes. So I'm not gonna show you, you know, in person, but I want you to picture this. So I wanna take out your hand, right? Left hand, right hand, whichever is fine, right? Take out your hand and look at your fingers. And I want you to think, how long does it take for me to clean that hand? So think about it, right? You have to make sure every inch is clean. 
every part under your nails, on the sides, under your finger, you know, in between your fingers, all of it. How long would you take for that? So, you guys are stepping into my shoes now, right? You're in my, you're in my brain now. How many of you guys want to try and guess? So, think of an hour, a minute, a day, whatever, right? Think of how long it would take for me to clean. How many seconds? Anyone want to try? You guys can scream. It's fine. Nobody's going to scream. Sorry? 120. 120? One minute and 20 seconds or? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So we got that. Next one? Next week. Next week? Okay. Uh, next week. All right. So we got one next week. Another one? Never. I didn't hear. What? Never be clean. Never be clean? Okay, you're very good. You're like my therapist. Um, <laughs> no, but it is true, right? Because you step out of the toilet, you'll be dirty already, right? But it's all that fear. You get what I mean? It's that anxiety, that what if. So, okay, keep on thinking. How long does it take? 12 hours. 12 hours, okay. So we've got 12 hours. One last one. Anyone else? One last one. How long do you take? How, how long would I take to clean? One, one hour? Okay. So the longest, well, reasonably the longest is 12 hours, right? I can't really do one week, but 12 hours. It's still very far from the longest I've taken. You guys want to know how long I took? I took 22 hours. Now, that's very abstract for people like you, because you would be asleep by 22 hours. So let me put this into a picture and then after that we're done, right? We're going to Q&A. You wake up, right, for class at eight o'clock. So you wake up at 7.30, I wake up at 7.30. You both wake up at the same time, you go into the washroom, right, you do your business, you do your thing, you check yourself in the mirror, and you step outside. I'm still washing my hands. You go downstairs, you meet up with your boy, hey, Sebastian, hey, what's up, man? And you go out to have breakfast before your class. I'm still in the washroom. You go into class, you sit down, you listen to Dr. Sebastian, and you, you know, hear out what you guys are studying. Most of you guys are engineering, right? So you guys learn about, uh, not most of you can, okay, you guys are learning about something. I'm still in the washroom. After lunch, you laugh with your friends, you make friendly, you know, uh, advancements in your relationships, right? I'm still in the washroom. You go for your second class in the afternoon, you're having a food coma, and you really want to sleep. Guess where I am? The washroom. By now, after lunch, I have moved from my thumb to my middle finger and I'm cleaning my middle finger now. Now you're done with classes for the day, you've had all of your learning and everything is done. You go to dinner with your friends or with your family. I have just moved to my pinky and I'm cleaning my pinky now. After dinner, you go home, you've made friends, you've laughed and you know, you're, you're, you had a great day. Right? Not a bad day, but a really great day. You're, you, know, you have memories, you have inside jokes with your friends, right? all that. I've just finished my pinky. And then you go to sleep. Right? But before you sleep, you're like, mm, I want to get some you know, uh, food, right? some snack for supper. So you go downstairs to the kitchen, get a snack, or you go to 7-Eleven here. Right? I've just only started my thumb on my other hand. So for your whole day, it took me one hand. And by the time you go to sleep, I've just got to my other thumb. Now you're sleeping, right? You're dreaming, you're, you know, uh, getting well rested and, you know, you're about to, I don't know, play some Valorant with your friends. I've just moved to my middle finger. Right? And constantly going, Right, so I want you to jump three slides, next. No, uh, back. This is the result of 22 hours. So the first picture over there is my abdomen. 
my stomach. How many of you guys want to guess what that is? It's okay, I'll tell you. Those are second degree chemical burns. So you guys can get burned by fire, but you can also get burned by chemicals. What you're seeing there is 75% alcohol hand sanitizers mixed with Dettol soap that wasn't washed off. So Monday, it was there, still there. Tuesday, still there. Thursday, still there. Sunday, where you go to see the Lord, it's still there. The middle picture is my feet. Because I stood for 22 hours, my feet swell. And that is what you call fluid retention. For those of you bio students, right? fluid retention. My feet were swollen because I didn't you know, have it rest or anything like that. So it swelled up and it was fluid. So if you pressed my foot, I felt pain. But if you pressed it, it wasn't tough. It was just like fluid, right? Like gel. Third one was my fingers. If you can't really see, it's okay. My fingers would tear and bleed and crack and peel. Why? Because of hand sanitizers and soaps that I constantly left on and they basically dissolved my skin. So they would dissolve and go in and in and in and in and in until they reached my blood vessel and then it popped and it would just bleed. But you would think if it's bleeding, you don't put anything in it, right? It makes sense. It doesn't make sense to a person with OCD, right? So what I do is with an open wound, hand sanitizer again and again and again and again and I don't just put hand sanitizer and leave it there to look pretty I would rub so 75% alcohol right lots of pain you add pressure it's even more now you guys were thinking ah just stop it doesn't make sense you're stupid I would want to but when you tell me to stop cleaning what you're saying is just kill off everyone else that you touch that's what you're saying to me, right? Because I'm afraid of germs. If I pass it to you or I touch your hand or whatever, or you accidentally walk past me, what I'm seeing is you guys getting sick and it's my fault. So when you tell me don't clean inside your womb, what you're saying is just kill off Raynard, right? Just kill off Christelle. Just kill off, you know, whoever. Think of your loved ones, your family, your friends, whoever. What you're telling me to do is kill them by not cleaning. So that's the picture. Okay. So very quickly, I know I'm a bit over time. So next one, right? Next one, next one. These are some common struggles, right? Therapeutic uh, relationships is something I want to talk to you guys a bit more. But the very last one is, will you touch their scars? Regardless of their struggles, they will have struggles. But just like how I talked about, right, all of these scars, the most uh, help you can give someone is when you're willing to touch their scars. So for example, my chemical burns, if you are willing to step into my suffering, if you're willing to walk with me, sometimes it may take you that extra effort to touch my scars. And that's where you get to do the most good for me or for someone who's struggling in your life, right? With mental health. Are you willing to touch their scars, right? Whether it's chemical burn or a self-harm cut on their wrist or, or their thigh, that's the whole idea, right? Are you willing to touch their scars? So next slide. So it's been a little while, but if you're listening, um, I just have one thing to say. This session is going to be done in a bit, right? Very soon. And you guys will be going home. You guys are going to be fine, right? You guys are safe. But I won't. Because for people like me, the past 40 minutes is just a snapshot of every day, every hour, every minute, every second. So, next slide. Don't forget us.
I, I, I'm begging you, if I could physically, right, I would kneel and I would beg you, please, if you have any space in your heart, don't forget us. Not just me, your friends, family, anyone that you meet that has told you that they are struggling with mental illness, do not forget them. Okay? Because if you do, that means somebody else will as well. Right? If you forget me, others will too. But if you don't forget, then there's a chance that someone else will also remember you. Okay? So thank you guys for listening. Um, I think we'll have time for Q and A. So you can go to the last slide. I think there was some. Oh, is that actually? Yeah, yeah. And then you can also find some details there as well. But yeah, you can go into Q and A. So sorry, Joanne. Please don't kill me. Oh, okay, we only went by fifteen minutes. <laughs> Okay, um, so we're having our Q&A now. Um, if you have any questions, you can scan the code and yeah. Okay, um, so I guess I'll answer um, the first one. Um, how does Christ's death on the cross affect the way you live? Very good question. Um, so as a Christian, um, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is very important, to say the least. So how does it affect your life? When you're looking at it from a mental health point of view, it's not as clear-cut because when you're saying how does it affect the way you live what you're saying is kind of like what every other church member is kind of thinking right so when you believe in jesus death burial and resurrection what you're thinking is okay when you believe in that everything else is fine which isn't biblical right because you can believe that God is real, God is good, right? Jesus is God. Jesus died and was resurrected. But you can still be Chinese. You can still have the same biological makeup, the same hormones, the same, you know, everything. That, that's why it's called the process of sanctification, right? You are being made into Christ-likeness. You are, you're going in that process. So if you're saying, how does it affect the way I live? It does in every way. But does it affect my mental illness? Unfortunately not. Right? So if you ask me, how does it affect the way I live? I try my best to be as generous as I can. I try to be as loving and as Christ-like as I can. I, I'm still a sinner, right? But I try to be as best as I can to be a salt and light in my social circles. Right? But it's not always the case um, when it comes to mental illness. Some people are unable to deal with uh, faith because they have scrupulosity, right? Religious OCD. And so they have this idea like, what if I have made the unpardon uh, unpardonable sin? Right? What, what if I've done something that has pushed me out of God's grace or, or something like that? And so it's not always the case that it will affect the way you live, right? But if you ask me personally, it has affected me in every way. It's just that with mental illness, it's not as simple as as a clear cut. Okay, now you've believed you're safe not from mental illness. Uh, that's not usually the case. Um, okay. yeah. uh, thank you. Um, if you like a certain question, then please like it. Uh, okay, so I think um, I'll go with the most like. How do you deal with thoughts of wanting to die? I'm slowly losing a solid reason to continue living if dying and going to heaven is so much better. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking that. Um, 
like I said, this is a safe place for you, um, and I resonate with you. Um, a lot of people kind of think like, oh, Earth is so much fun, right? Why would you want to go to heaven and you just play the harp and it's it? Uh, that's not heaven, right? If you read scripture and you look at all of the doctrines, the whole idea of heaven is it's the pure, unadulterated, just really complete and absolute presence of God. And what is God? God is love, right? He is holy. He's Maj uh, majestic and, and all these kinds of beautiful things and so if you're saying earth is better than that I'm like eh, um, you know not really so uh, when I have to deal with struggles like that there are a couple of things um, number one is when I have those thoughts I talk to people people who understand so for those of you who can see Right? That's my sister at the back. So, hi, Kim, Kim, hi. Yeah, that's my sister. So whenever I have those thoughts, I talk to her. Right? I talk to her and another sister of mine from the States. Uh, in the States. So she's there. Uh, so I'll call her, right, at 3 a.m. or whatever, and I'll be like, Jay, I want to die. Right? That kind of thing. And she'll talk to me. So that's one way I deal with it. Um, and another one that I deal with personally is I think of you, right? Having the opportunity to come here, talk to you guys, and hopefully, right, if one of you is struggling, like, like you, right, and thank you for being so brave, um, I get to talk to you and hopefully give you a bit of comfort to know that you're not alone and that, like I said, anything and everything uh, that you can use that will be helpful you know, is something that you can use. So for, for some of you, if uh, for you, right, um, if you are struggling with it and you don't have anyone to talk to, you can reach out to me. Now, I'm not a therapist. I'm not your doctor, right? But I can just hear you out, right? And after that, if you feel like you could benefit, you can reach out to a therapist, right? On campus, there's a therapist. That's okay. Let's still have the therapist. Yeah, so there's still some therapists on campus. Uh, I'm not sure who they are, but if you feel comfortable and you think that it would benefit you, reach out to them, right? But um, please know that when you are dealing with this reasoning and, and having to figure out where exactly is the meaning of your life and all that, it's a big thing. But if I can encourage you, right? if you're really struggling, um, I'm not sure if you guys know who this is, but Jordan Peterson, right? He always says it is... The, the whole idea of narrowing your time frame, right? So what does that mean? When you are depressed and you're suicidal, you have to think, oh man, how am I gonna make it to next month? Shorten it, next week. Too much, it's okay, shorten it. One day, how are you gonna make it for this next day? Too much, it's okay, shorten it, right? Until next meal time, shorten it. One minute, 30 seconds. But you have the opportunity and the responsibility to yourself to make it to the next point in time. So whether that's Netflix, YouTube, right? Uh, Valorant, although Valorant's not really helpful, right? But uh, whatever, right? Gaming, talking to a friend, prayer, scripture, whatever it helps to get you to the next time, use that. Right. So for me, it's you guys, right, and helping you guys, serving you guys, and uh, family and close friends. So that's something that's been helpful for me. Um, but I'll keep you in prayer, and please reach out to me if you can, uh, if you're comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So uh, next question is, uh, I don't want to open up to my friends because I feel like I'm just a burden. They don't have to listen to me. Why should I make them listen to my struggles? Yeah. So I guess this is. Sort of what I went through as well, right, in church. Um, and so everyone here, even the person who's asking the question, right, uh, but everyone who didn't answer the question, you guys have a responsibility. How do you live or, or act in a way where that person would realize the way I'm thinking doesn't make sense because this guy is acting this way or that girl is acting that way. So when you act in a caring way, when you're acting in a way that 
encourages people to be open and honest and raw and just be themselves, then they won't have that nagging feeling. I mean, it'll still be there, but then they'll think, okay, actually it's easier to reach out to them, right? But for the person who you are uh, asking this question, it's tough because you're dealing with a lot of doubt, sort of like me. Um, so when you're dealing with doubt, one thing is to challenge that doubt. So if you feel like your friends can't uh, have the time to think of your struggles and, and you think you're a burden, um, I would suggest that you try and challenge that. Now, how do you challenge that? You ask your friend about something smaller. So, for example, you have um, an eating disorder. Right? Let's say, right? I, I don't, I'm not saying you do, but let's say you have an eating disorder and you talk to a person about um, maybe stress first, right? Exam stress or something. See if they're willing to hear you out about that. And if they are about something so small that, you know, okay, not really small, but uh, something that's not as serious as an eating disorder in some sense, then what more would they want to hear about something that really affects your life, right? Or maybe you got boy troubles or whatever, right? So say something smaller first. And if you think that they are uh, willing to give you that time, then by all means, go right ahead. But um, I can tell you right now, a lot of people live with regret. Uh, people that I know live with regret because they were always asking themselves, why did this person take their life when all of us were here to take care of that person or willing to hear them out? And the whole question is, yeah, you may have been willing to hear them out, but how do they know? How do you act? Right? When they tell you about small struggles, how do you respond? So that's something. Um, start with small things, right? And if you feel like you can't really reach out to your friends right now, uh, you can reach out to other friends, right? The world is too big, not very big, but too big, right? So you can really find someone out there right, um, who can walk with you. And sometimes you may not need friends. You may just need someone like a professional, right? A therapist, um, sometimes a pastor, right? Um, and that's okay. Right, whichever the uh, way, but reaching out to someone is always helpful. And I know this is very cliche, but please know that you're not a burden. <coughs> if, right? You're only a burden if you take people's money and then you go to that vending machine that plays music and then you just sit there and put the money inside. Put the money inside. That's the only way you're gonna be a burden. You don't get a drink or anything, you just, yeah. I don't know why you guys have music. But anyway, yeah, might have been helpful for me. Um, yeah, so next question is, um, does being a Christian help you battle your mental health? Ooh! Should I be honest or not? Um, <laughs> yes, okay. You guys asked for it. Um, no, I'm joking. Yes, it has. Um, like I said, scripture has been huge. Um, one thing also that I didn't list out, worship songs, right? And some people like upbeat some people like emo. I like emo, so I listen to a lot of uh, Chris Renzema, if you guys know. Uh, David Dunn, that's another one. Um, you know, all of these uh, songs that aren't hype. You know, music that, that really speaks to your soul and tells you about the reality of life, right? Something that, you know, you're struggling with doubt as a Christian hey, there's a song for that, you know? You're struggling with anxiety, there's a song for that. And it's not like, oh, you know, uh, it's a new day and everything's gonna be fine. Like, no, like these are real tough things, right? And so, so some songs are there. Um, so I think being a Christian has helped me in terms of scripture, uh, worship, and ultimately knowing that this life isn't all there is. So the idea, right, the doctrine of, Christianity is that this isn't it, right? This life, whatever ups and downs and all that, that's not it, right? There's so much more. And so that's been very helpful. Um, yeah, but I also want to say that there are things that are not necessarily Christian that can be helpful, right? Things like I mentioned just now, common grace, medication, therapy, right? For me, 
when I first had my anxiety and all that, I lost 11 kg. Oh, I didn't mention that just now, but I lost 11 kg because of how I couldn't eat. And I was just so stressed and so sleep deprived. You guys want to know what's the thing that helped me the most? Spider. You guys remember uh, Into the Spider-Verse, that movie? Oh, dude, it's so good. You guys haven't watched it. It's dope. But uh, I, I, my anxiety was really helped by that. Right? Because the, the, the scene where Miles Morales and the dad, the cop dad was talking on the door and he said, I see that spark in you. And that's why I'm so harsh on you. And I thought, oh man, that's kind of what I feel, right? When God is putting all of this in my life it's because he's seeing something that I can do, right? To help others, to help, you know, glorify his name. So that's not Christian. Spider-Man's not Christian, right? But that's okay, <laughs> right? Whatever, like I said, that is helpful, please use that, right? But uh, don't think that Christianity can't help. It also can. So, yeah. Okay, um, so Are due to... to... No, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. It's good. Okay. <laughs> um, so due to time, uh, I'll just answer, ask you one last question. Um, so how are you doing now? Everyone oh, pretty much wants to know. I'm, I'm doing okay, thank you. Um, taking it one step at a time. I'm uh, still going through therapy. I'm still on medication. Um, some days are good, some days are bad. Some times I find myself praying to God that He would take me to heaven. And other days I pray that He would make my time here on earth good and useful, you know, so uh, one step at a time. But I'm praying that, you know, as more opportunities come and I get to speak to more people, because I think, especially in Malaysia, right, mental health really needs to be talked about more. Um, and I think the church really needs to step up. So I'm, I'm hoping that when I show up, reach out to more people and hopefully other people see and then they step in as well. So yeah, pray for me in that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, we may not be able to answer the questions right now, but don't worry, as uh, Mr. Guan would love to answer all the unanswered questions, and we will definitely post on our social media so you guys can uh, look through the answers as well. Um, yeah, so one more. So, <laughs> one more. Okay, I'll go with the most liked. Okay. okay um, do you think that it can be mentally taxing for your loved ones to constantly check up on you? They may be keeping you in prayer, but not text you every day. Mm. Yes, Kim. <laughs> yeah, no, it is true. It, it does take effort and a lot of sacrifice and all that. But again, it comes down to asking yourself, right? Are you okay for the sake of others? If you're not okay for the sake of others, that's fine. But if you are, then what better thing to sacrifice for than your friend's well-being or your loved one's well-being, you know? So, yeah, it is possible. You can pray for them. It doesn't, and I'm not saying you cannot pray, but you can pray. But um, it's, it's knowing what is worth the sacrifice, right? So if you can have extra time, extra money, extra whatever, use that for other people, right? Um, because they would need it. And it's a good feeling to know that your sacrifice has saved some person, right? And that person is alive because you, uh, by the grace of God, has stepped into that person's life and changed it for the better. So, yeah, that's something. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lukwai. Um, so now I'll pass the time to Gloria to give the love gift. <laughs> So sorry again to the committee, Zahan, I know you're probably thinking about, you know, how you're going to pray for me later and how God is going to scold me. I'm sorry for going over time. Um, it's okay. Yeah, so let's all raise our hands towards Mr. God and let's all pray for him. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we come before you, Lord, 
And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your son, your servant, Mr. Yuk Kwan, Lord, who's here to speak to us today, Lord. Lord, um, this topic of mental health, Lord, is not something easier, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you've given him the courage, Lord, and that you have used him, Lord, so mightily, Lord, to come and speak and share his journey with us today, Lord. Lord, we know, Lord, that you know that life is hard, and that the world can be a tough place, O Lord. Lord, we thank you for your love and for your grace, O Lord. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that as we journey in this life, Lord, and from what we've heard today, O Lord, that you'll be able to, you know, apply it in our lives, O Lord, that we'll be able to take it one step at a time too, Lord, and to know and trust in you too, and to believe, Lord, that, um, you are the Prince of Peace, O Lord, and that you will give us your divine peace and rest in you, O Lord. Lord, we thank you for Mr. Guan again. We thank you, Lord, for his family. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for each and everything, Lord, that he's doing for you, O Lord, for your ministry, Lord, and especially in this aspect of mental health, Lord. Lord, you continue to bless him, journey with him, O Lord, and use him mightily, Lord, for your kingdom, Lord. We Surrender this all into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.